There's a difference between quality of belief and quality of intellect and the ability to synthesize ideas with a person. Two people could be in the same place or achieve the same solution, but arrive there by totally different mechanisms. One person may stumble into a local bar because limited motivation or available options determined this was the best bar available, whereas someone else is there because they searched TripAdvisor and read that it was the most delicious place in the world. In this scenario, two patrons arrive at the same place at the same time, but through drastically different methods. One person found this place due to the end result of a hunt for excellence, while the other patron was there because they had no other options. A lot of ideas and behaviors in this world are arrived at by similarly opposing methods. Some people arrive at a belief through ignorance, and some through complete knowledge. If you think that both of those people are equally qualified to speak on issues because they chose the same action, well, then you're in for a rude awakening. This is because one, through complete knowledge, one has a lot of new options, things you can learn. As for the person that arrived there through ignorance or was forced there, well, you can't really build anything new with that guy. The learning of order of operations is really important for being effective some math you can't do in a randomized order. In other words, some equations are not commutative. The same is true for martial arts. If you learn all the fake ones before the real ones, you're basically starting from scratch. But if you learn the real ones and then observe the fake ones, then you basically kind of just adopt what's useful and ignore what's impractical. It's kind of the same with critical thinking. If you take a person that's a great critical thinker and you put them in an environment of stupidity and falsehood, although there may still be a few good ideas there, he's more qualified to pick out the good ideas and ignore the crap. Therefore, if you're a smart, critical thinking guy, you could probably derive benefit from reading lots of things that are terrible, things which may cripple or poison a weaker mind. It's like the ability to be an omnivore and digest the things that are useful while remaining immune to the things that are harmful. It's really an order of operations issue. If you get the wrong books first, you cripple yourself and get the worst things, the wrong things, out of the subsequent books. If you instead read the right books first, then it just amplifies your progress, even when reading subpar books later on. That's why the rich get richer, the smart get smarter, and the divergence grows. Mere awareness is not a skill. Mere awareness is not a skill. Similar to all other skills in the world, just because you know there is a way to do a thing better, doesn't mean you can do the thing better. Skill comes with correct knowledge put to use and practiced over time. What use is there knowing a tool exists and even owning it if you never get the inspiration that it's now the right time for that tool. The wise person is usually kind of a loner and not that powerful, but just knows or can predict what is likely to happen if you do a certain thing. The wisdom of crowds and ignorance of mobs. You only get wisdom if everyone is guessing independently. If everyone can see everyone else's guesses, it's worse, not better. What is wisdom? Wisdom is when your intelligence has been applied to a body the wisdom of crowds, and ignorance of mobs. 
You only get wisdom if everyone is guessing independently. If everyone can see everyone else's guesses, it's worse, not better. What is wisdom? Wisdom is when your intelligence has been applied to a body of knowledge over a long enough time and is in congruence enough with the underlying situation of the world that you have a very strong boat floating, high sailing, the right way down the river. What most people think is common wisdom is surely not, and may be the definition of the fallacy of proof by popularity. The wise person is usually kind of alone and not that powerful, but just knows what is likely to happen if you do a certain thing. We need to direct intellect to more motivation, belief, discipline-based things. The reason Uber was able to revolutionize, or rather create, a new industry that served the same purpose as the taxi industry did, and at much lower cost, was because there was a shitload of unused resources sitting around. Taxis aimlessly idling, waiting for nearby passengers, for example. There were people and cars that could drive, and there were roads with space, and everything was ready, but the glue was missing. The glue that was required was an app that put people that wanted rides together with people that could give rides. And so, what is the problem that we currently have in the get shit done world? We've got tons and tons and tons of unused resources, which is the ability for human beings to actually do shit. What's missing? Well, it's not knowledge. We don't need more knowledge. We have too much knowledge. It's all free. It's available 24-7. It's all the best it's ever been, and you are using none of it. Who cares? You learn more? Great. Now there's just more stuff that you know that you're still not using. What we need is a human desire-based, belief-based, motivation-based, discipline-based glue. A binder that bridges the gap between knowing all the stuff that we could do and actually doing it. No amount of shoving facts into people's heads is getting that job done. Processing power overhead. A word to describe what you've learned multiplied by your brain power. There should be a single word to describe what you've learned multiplied by how powerful your brain is. If we have a good enough understanding of how our consciousness works to separate intelligence from knowledge, then surely we must see that either one by itself is worthless, or that benefits can only be realized when the two are combined. Need we invent a new word for applied intelligence over time? Like power is energy multiplied by time? Mental power shall be intelligence applied to gathering and synthesizing new knowledge over time. Being correct. Knowing when you're right or wrong. Being correct and knowing whether you're right or wrong about a thing is super important, because if you think you're right and you're not, you will stop learning. You'll continue to remain wrong and you'll force yourself into a conversation, depriving the person who is right the significance that they should get socially and their ability to influence others further. Instead, it will be replaced with your misguided ignorance. Thus, if you want to be right about things, you not only need to do work to be right, but you also need to do the work of knowing whether you're right or not. If you're a person that only speaks in absolutes of right and wrong, you're already delusional. A much more intelligent and realistic measurement is what is the chance that you're right in numbers? Do you think this if 50-50 or 70-30? How much time have you put in? Do you have access to knowledge other people don't? How many thoughts of other people have you read? How confident should you be in your measurements? Now, as an example, the people in this world that are most right are also the people that are most likely to know when they're wrong, continue to learn, and continue to work and understand and test themselves empirically to see whether they actually got it or not. This is evident everywhere. For example, there was once a publication that said, if you get an AIDS test and you get a positive result and the test is 95% accurate, how likely are you to have AIDS? 
They give this test to all kinds of people, and it's actually so misunderstood that it's called the false positive paradox. It's called paradox not because paradoxes actually exist. It's called paradox because people's understanding of the world is so poor and so often at odds with the actual world that we decide to call those things that we commonly get wrong paradoxes. A paradox exists because humans' perception of reality is so commonly inaccurate in regards to this specific thing, we call that a paradox. There are a couple other definitions, but for the way it's being used here, it's accurate. Do some research on Bayes' theorem, the false positive pa paradox, the prosecutor's fallacy, and the more advanced scientific understanding, which dictates how sometimes there's this thing called specificity, and there's a thing called accuracy, and how they're different. Accuracy is a probability on how likely it is to give you the knowledge that a thing is there when it's actually there. Specificity is how likely the thing is to tell you that it's not there when it's not there. You'll get it wrong in both directions. Sometimes it'll be there and you won't catch it, therefore your test is less accurate. Sometimes you'll think it's there and it's really not, and sometimes it's not there, but you think it is. You end up with this set of four. Is it really there or not? Did we really think it's there or not? And then after looking at that table of four, you've got to do the math for each one of those sections. And depending on how your question is phrased, you can derive those answers that you're looking for. None of those previous examples went as deep into false positive, false negatives, and understanding values, specificity, accuracy. That was the most advanced, actual, executable, useful knowledge of it. It was more advanced than the prosecutor's fallacy. It was more advanced than the false positive paradox. It was what Saivive found to be the most useful World War application of the knowledge that can form an in-depth understanding of Bayes' theorem. If you just see Bayes' theorem sitting there on a piece of paper, good luck deriving meaning out of that shit. You have to know what the abbreviations mean. And in Wikipedia, the abbreviations aren't well defined, and yet you have to find out what those variables, what those Greek letters actually mean. Knowledge that makes you less certain. Survivalists don't like interesting knowledge that makes you less certain. You should inherently love the feeling of progress and excellence. And that only comes with certainty. If you don't know why the right thing is right, you don't really know it's the right thing. If you think you know the best burger in the city, but have only visited three places, you don't know the best burger. IQ. Smarts are genetic. If mental illness can be inherited, why not mental wellness or superiority? Schizophrenia has about 80% concordance amongst twins, but it was once thought to be bad parenting. IQ. Kinetic ability versus potential ability should reduce the fear slash hatred of differences in IQ. People overestimate the value of intelligence in comparison to motivation, delayed gratification. How many people do you know living up to their potential? Is it because they don't know what to do or because they won't do what they should? If the difference in results is traction, not horsepower, then don't worry so much about someone's larger or smaller motor. Cascading advantage. People underestimate the value of small changes in some types of intelligence. They cascade. If you learn how to learn faster or better, it cascades across all the new learning. Imagine a bookshelf versus a stack of books. Some people develop tricks early on that are the shelves. Hit a golf ball a little crooked and see how far off course it ends up once it has traveled a few hundred yards. Different is better. The social programming to search for equality amongst humans ignores the value of evolution, competition, mediocrity, and the resultant emergent fitness and excellent that results. Different, sometimes better, sometimes worse, is a requirement for robustness and progress. Making a good IQ test. When you create an IQ test, you use specific strategies to avoid cultural bias, 
and measure useful traits like memory, speed, visualization, rotating objects in one's mind, etc. Why not just declare the results by category? The test maker knew what he was measuring. There's no reason to mush it all together. Max and min IQ for jobs. Few people realize that you can actually be turned down for a job for being too smart. This happens all the time in police forces around the United States. AI, machine intelligence. An artificial intelligence has an easy time doing things that you require thought for and a hard time doing things you can do without thinking. Creativity, humor, but not funny. Funny stuff is funny because it doesn't make sense. Creative ideas are new and interesting, but not funny because they work. They cause you to feel awe and inspiration more than giggles. They're related, but one becomes reality and the other fantasy. Unless it's a prank, then it's real. The amateur imitates what the master improves. Quote by Richard. Capture all your ideas. Don't get yourself into too much trouble with rabbit holes. If you're smart and fast, you realize that everything is really related to everything else and that everything can be learned from and applied everywhere else and that there's an entire world ripe for improvement out there. You come up with basically a million great ideas, and the art is to just get them all captured and sort them later. So that is what you'll learn to do automatically over time, if you practice. Don't be afraid to capture a ton of very rough ideas and adjust them later. Negative space. What's not there? Inductive and deductive logic. You see things and you say why, but I dream things that never were. And I say, why not? Try things that are old somewhere else, but new here. Trying ideas that work on one thing, on other things. You may sometimes see things and ask why, but you could instead focus on dreaming up things that never were and ask yourself, why not? Additionally, you can try inventing, reinventing ideas that are old, applied to one field, but are new or untested in other unrelated areas or fields. Try experimenting with things that currently work and mold them into other new areas or aspects of life. Cross ventions, if you will. Cross jurisdictions with ideas for undiscovered power. Proof of work and signaling theory. You could have invented proof of work for Bitcoin or CAPTCHA for websites. You must have a phone number to sign up for a Gmail account because they are all proofs of work that verify honest communication or identity. These are the same proofs of work that animals use to pretty up their mating area or perform their mating dance or display those cool colors that say, hey, I'm poisonous, so don't eat me. The handicap principle, which says that reliable signals must be costly to the signaler in order to be trusted, this could be used to generate all kinds of anti-spam and useful social inventions if the effective evolved principle was experimented with to apply it different places in the real world. Location, speed, size, combination, color, material, sound, payment plans. Take what works one place and see if it works another place. Globalization is one of the simplest forms of this. If a hot dog stand does well in Chicago, maybe it will work in Shanghai. In that model, you just change the location. Maybe you keep the location, but change packaging color instead. Or maybe you carbonate it. You get the idea. If something works in one area of life, it's very common for it to work in other areas too. TLDR. What useful and effective evolved strategies can be exported to other disciplines and great gains received? Is not the feedback system in eBay a digital execution of what we have in normal human-to-human -human relationships of trust? Mind you, the eBay account that you're giving your trust to has no face, never invites you to its birthday party. However, the principle still works, and for the same reason that it works for human-on-human -human communication. Improve on things that are not new, but known good. 
This is the meaning of the phrase, artists imitate, masters steal. Tropes. If it hasn't been done in a book or a movie, then it may have never happened at all. Whatever you're thinking, whatever you are experiencing, it's very likely someone in one of these fictional worlds has gone through something almost the same as you. You can learn from what they learned from, or you could meet the author and see what insights he might have into the situation, because he's obviously put some thought into it to make a story out of it. Once you see that all new events are kind of the same happening over and over with little twists on them, you can export tactics from situations you know how to handle well to other situations you don't know how to handle by discovering they were structurally almost the same. Certain formats work so well, even the most creative industries copy them over and over again. Trailer formats and length. Blue and orange covers for movie posters and DVD covers. Hell, the movies themselves. When you should worry about creativity. You must build off greatness rather than try to create your own greatness to catch up and then try to build off your own. You cripple yourself by not catching up to where the world already is. Greatness rarely emerges from a vacuum. When should you make your own martial art? Probably after you've learned a few others. When you will get more out of yourself than you will by leeching others' creativity. Similarly, when should you write your own music? Listening to a variety of already existing music would be a good place to start. If you tried to write music without ever having heard any, you would have to reinvent the chords themselves. But that work has already been done for you in existing compositions. Creative Ingredients Perfect pitch means you can hear a sound and figure out instantly how to create that sound. I would say that food would have something similar. When you take food, do you know how to make that flavor? You can also kind of relate it to dance. If you see someone do a dance move on TV, can you do that dance move and how long would it take you to try? You'll find that only some people can, and most people cannot. That's the difference between ingredients and finished output. If you know how to dance and can break a dance set into its little pieces, then you now have those ingredients and you can combine them into a new and beautiful thing. Just like painting and brushes and canvas are just like words. So if you take a beautiful phrase or sentence and then you inspect the words contained within, does that mean you can go create a new amazing sentence out of those words? Well, maybe, maybe not. There's a place in this world for beautiful sentences, and then there's a place for people that can create them. There's a place for people that can create movies, and there's a place for people to watch them. The universals that Sci Vival is most addicted to, that allow one to create new things, are surely not even of interest to anyone else unless they want to create new things themselves. There are a lot of people that are happy to eat without watching the butchering of the animal. Shower thoughts and freeing up the mind for creativity. Shower thoughts. How odd is it that the most resonant name for the idea of unique things you think of is shower thoughts? Why is it that these things occur so often in the shower and so rarely in other places? SciVive maintains that we have a whole lot of great processing power in these great brains of ours, and that somewhere along the line, one of our great ancestors, someone started running their brain constantly. Instead of only solving problems that were readily apparent, they started solving problems that didn't exist yet. In the animal world, that is basically what play is. You're getting the training and practice that you need without having to risk your life to get it. That's what imagination and deep thought is for human beings. It's our version of animal play. It's what makes us more effective when the time comes, and often we can even the situation where our creative thinking will pay off. It's not just the outcome from the environment. Example, we change our environment to suit us more often than we change ourselves to match our environment. Is anyone out there still wiping their ass with leaves? Shower thoughts are really cool because they are more creative than what you would normally think of. It actually broadens the range of inputs you are using to synthesize new ideas.
which is what creativity is. Your environment greatly affects the creative output of your mind because your mind is basically trying to pre-calculate routines that might appear so that it's responsibly faster if those routines occur. This is what part of what deja vu could be. Your brain already pre-calculated a thing that might have happened a long time ago when you weren't noticing. Then it actually happened and you're like, hey, wait a sec, I kind of recognize this shit. Shower thoughts are broader because the range that we use for our creativity is actually limited by our surroundings. For instance, if we're in a social setting around a lot of people, our brains would try to optimize the relations between people, the environment, and the posture. There are so many social things that go on in a social setting that occupy your mind, like trying to understand what other people are saying, trying to educate them, tell them things, etc. It's very consuming to the mind. So when you are in the shower, you probably don't have music. You probably don't have to think where to go next or people you are trying to impress. It allows you to free your mind to create and synthesize new ideas using a broad range of inputs that can be a lot more random. This is because they're not being refined or restricted to the same content matter that exists during the rest of the day. Whether we are being influenced by work or school or by a lover or any other type of social setting. Creative excellence. Creative mix. If you are a creative or dedicated person and will just throw lots of shit at the wall, if you identify what excellence is, the components that make it up, and then just mess around in the area and mix things together, whether it be different sounds, the correct beats, or different colors, shapes, and textures for art, and then you mix and transmute those into what might be an okay-looking form that hasn't been well-marketed yet, then you can create quality production and any creative art that didn't require insane amounts of training, such as actually playing an instrument instead of sampling it, singing instead of having someone else sing or sampling it, actually using digital art tactics or the assistance of others to execute an idea, visually or animate. You can create beautiful things even if you can't specifically do the thing yourself. Many books are written by multiple parties. There's an editor, there's the illustrator that does the cover, there's the person that writes the text, and sometimes there's expert consultants that you go to to see whether these things are expert or done properly. All you need to know is what excellence looks like. Mix it up, mash it up, and through that exercise, you might discover a new form of excellence that people didn't see previously. Now, you've not only permutated something beautiful, but you've also added to the science, which would amplify and allow others to go and further expedite beauty based on your new archetype, and that has exponentially multiplying effects throughout time. Hard to train people to be creative and feedback loops. Part of the reason why it's so hard to train people to be creative is that there's no feedback loop by which they can, without someone else's trusted input, be told that what they did was actually worthless. But if you're building a website and the website doesn't load, you know it's garbage. It's not up for debate. If you draw a graphic, you might think it's great, even if to the rest of the world it is not. Having aesthetic understanding inside your brain as a human, even that is pretty common which is why you don't see people walking around wearing garbage bags, usually. It's because people think that shit looks ugly, feels bad, looks bad, smells bad, and sounds bad. They have aesthetic internal programming, which tells them when something is weak. But the more advanced the creative topic is, the harder and harder that feedback loop gets. You choose an infrastructure, you choose a lifestyle. You choose a way to write a passage, a sentence, a paragraph, and you have no realistic way of knowing how far, percentage-wise, you are into the greatness that could exist. Therefore, it's hard to know when you should stop going down a path and work on the next thing. It's hard to know whether what you've built is the best it can be or not. The more creative and complicated your work gets, 
the harder it is to find a feedback loop to help the world train your output. A feedback loop says, hey, that's good, do more of that, or that doesn't work well, do less of that. The quicker and more obvious those things are, the easier it is to path against your own will or with your own will to greatness. You may sometimes get these creative ideas where you can't even generate your own internal, reliable opinion on whether or not it's menial, let alone search for an external trusted opinion. Now you can't test it and you end up with more variables and it is much more of a function of your original search space, your creativity, than it is your ability to properly path through that search space. You may see a lot of great software come out of America. Maybe not because they're better developers, but because they might be more creative. Maybe they are more aware of what is possible than someone that can just do the one thing that they are aware of well, but botch a lot of things up because the things that weren't specified properly, they get done wildly wrong. But a creative person, as he's coding it and doing it imperfectly, sees that it kind of isn't what you should have wanted, and then lets you know, hey, you shouldn't have wanted that, so I'm going to build it differently. Thank me later. The importance of feedback loops. Part of the reason why you should understand how important feedback loops are is the concept of the book, The Design of Everyday Things, written by Mr. Norman. The book illustrates good user interface and good usability, which is basically another way of saying human beings use it properly to the best of its ability and enjoy doing so. That mandates two things. One, that the available ways to use the thing are declared to you so that you can experiment with it and see which ways work and which ways don't. And that's the feedback loop. So the two core principles, and one should check to see if there's more, are declaring the options, using the options, and having feedback that you can understand. Synthesis. The important part is the synthesis. This is the highest and best application of the human ability and spirit to create something which has never before existed and is excellent. Synthesis is the mental sex which produces beautiful thought offspring. Trichotomy. A trichotomy is a three-way classificatory diversion. Some philosophers pursued trichotomies. From Wikipedia. Wavelengths of creativity. If it's smart or effective to write drunk and edit sober, then it's possible that certain types of thought have a frequency at which certain types of mind states resonate those frequencies easier. Maybe being tipsy restricts depth and enhances creativity in some ways. Maybe being on downers affects people in one way, being on hallucinogens does something different, and speed does another thing. It's therefore an interesting analogy to make that thoughts are like frequencies and that they resonate inside the chambers of one's mind differently based on the shape, size, and medium of density of air inside the chamber. Not the real chamber, but in theory, the virtual composition of a person's mind. To expand further upon that creativity idea, when you measure a speaker, you have what are called Thiel small parameters, which measure the electrical and mechanical resonance, weight, electrical motor force, magnet force, and if you have all those numbers, you can predict how that driver, that speaker, will act in an enclosure, and how it will respond to frequencies, especially the musical kind. That type of Thiel small parameterization could also exist amongst intelligent beings for searched depth, searched width. How far do you go down a path before you decide it's a dead end? How many offshoot paths do you try? What value do you give to paths that seem related? A lot of Thiel small parameters, speaker optimization, AI, and human creativity, and idea searching are related. Unique insights. For creativity exercises, you could try changing the color of your environment, temperature, location, space, Focus, posture, or mind focus. What part of your body are you focusing on? You could use archetype experiments where you pretend you're a king, pretend you're a poor person, 
Pretend you're angry. Pretend you're happy. Pretend you're all kinds of different shit to get different perspectives on a thing. After doing all that, maybe you'll have some new and unique insights that are still your own. Logic, frameworks, math. How is advanced math supposed to be useful to the average person? Of course, basic math is important in everyday life, but hard to profit from. Is there a shortage of people that know basic addition and subtraction? Can't WolfframeAlpha.com literally answer any question you properly type into it? How are you supposed to profit off of some knowledge that is so widespread and has been for thousands of years and now is literally done fast and instantly for free for anyone that has internet access and a browser? Is it important? Yes, but only as far as it serves things that are actually important. We need more people sticking parts together with human ideas as the glue. Let the grunts and machines do the work. Do what the machines can't. Be the middleware. There are only a select few occupations that would require one to know advanced mathematical theory. For example, statistics and algebra are important for business and machine learning. Frameworks and organizational structure. Which sex is better for breastfeeding? The answer is clearly women. Conversely, which is better at fist fighting? Well, probably the guy. Which one belongs on top? Nobody belongs on top. That would be using the wrong framework. You're not supposed to have such a simplistic relationship organization between utterly complex, utterly unsimplistic things that have been constantly changing, always evolving, different and different places relationship. Looking on the other side of the coin. Some have found more value than usual in looking in what is the not thing, the polar opposite. For instance, anytime you look at a question, you can look at the not question. It's a little hard to explain, but there's a natural example in the programming of humans with something called frustration. This helps dictate that they halt what they are doing and go do another thing, because otherwise they could just get stuck in a loop and keep trying the thing until they died of hunger, their arms fell off, or whatever other failure mode they hit. The example consisted of several options. You could either get them to stop by hating what they're doing or by really liking the next thing. And from a programming perspective, it's much easier to hate the one thing you have obviously in front of you than to be drawn by the vastness of everything else out there. It would be too hard and abstract to find a trigger in everything else out there to cause a halt. Zoom out for first principles. Because chunking and nesting ideas is so powerful, it's super useful to zoom out really far and make what you're looking at really small. This way, you get all these new little hook points you can anchor the data to in your mind. It's sort of like seeing the forest as a forest instead of only seeing lots of trees. Advanced logic. Advanced practitioners of logic and how to have the best grasp of logic. It's rather unfortunate that when you analyze some of the most advanced practitioners of logic in history, their lives left much to be desired. You take Wittgenstein, suicidal. Gay is derogatory, but it definitely indicates some kind of off-programming from what's normal. Hit kids and women and was a little bit violent towards kids if they didn't get their math right. He changed his view on religion a couple times. How does that happen? You either got it right or you didn't. You don't really get the luxury of switching between one stupid thing and another thing unless your mind is one that is forced to understand the unexplainable. Some minds tend to fill in the blanks with logic. Just to give you an idea about how respected Wittgenstein was, he actually was a student to Bertrand Russell. Bertrand Russell admitted his superiority and it basically changed his life when Russell was talking and Wittgenstein criticized. And at that moment, he knew he'd never be able to add to the science any longer, because there was someone else who just had it better. And what he was doing was kind of inaccurate compared to this other guy's version of things. 
When you look at the productivity the guy had, he only wrote a children's book. He released like three or four things in his whole lifetime. And then one of the most widely regarded good things that ever came out of him had to come out of his notes after he was dead. You even see other people like Schopenhauer who literally had to come up with a logical framework to describe why he says that. Aestheticism was great, but then he hoarded shit and was more hedonistic. His excuse, his logic, was that to be a philosopher, you need only build ideas, not be the ideas. You can sculpt a beautiful sculpture without being beautiful, and you can be beautiful without being a sculpture. That was a nice excuse, but most people, I think, see that if you don't use what you claim to know, and what you claim is amazing, you greatly reduce the confidence in what you're saying is true. To have the best grasp of logic, one of the best grasps of logic that the world has ever seen in the history of mankind, and yet seems to further execute logic in your own life so ineffectively, is the idea of God. It's somewhat like football players. They're amazing at what they do, but then in their personal lives and their financial lives, they're definitely not as good. Maybe there should be some other word for a person that accurately uses what they know to the highest and best use and outcome of its possibility, extending not only to the one focus, but to all aspects of their lives. Maybe that's wisdom. Saivive, however, argues that wisdom is not enough. I mean, you never picture the wise person as young, vital and fit, nor loved and popular. As stated earlier, the wise person is usually thought of as being kind of alone and not that powerful, although he knows what is likely to happen if you do a certain thing. Perhaps what Schopenhauer said was accurate. You can be an amazing sculptor yet remain ugly, which is kind of a bad analogy because using logic and building logic are very similar whereas looking pretty and sculpting pretty things have nothing in common. They don't touch, they're not related. You must simply understand what may be commonly recognized as pretty and be able to duplicate that. It's actually that particular exercise that Schopenhauer had for living life at odds with what he taught is the highest and best life you could live. Maybe it didn't accurately explain away his culpability or responsibility. Correlation, causation. Correlation isn't causation. Illogical pattern finding will lead you away from truth. Correlation, causation. Education regarding correlation and causation. There was an important lesson that was taught in an extremely memorable way, and it was probably one of the best lessons one can learn in college entirely. It was a trivia question that my sociology teacher gave me. It goes as follows. So, you're in a city, and one year the crime rate of the city doubles, and the number of people who attend church also doubles. What can you say about what's going on in that city? A lot of people would say that the new churchgoers are committing crimes. In fact, wouldn't it be easier if you noticed that the population of the city doubled as well? Therefore, really, nothing has changed in terms of ratio. There were twice as many churchgoers and twice as many crimes committed simply because the population doubled. Just because two things happen at the same time surely does not mean that they caused one another. Being stumped for that moment and not knowing what could have caused those two things to go up at the same time really drove home the point that the third, or more, cause is always out there and quite commonly overlooked. Two things that seem to be dependent on each other are actually both caused by a third thing, appears all the time logically. Saivayev believes that these serendipitous feelings and pattern-finding feelings are yet another effect of that third cause discovery, that third causes are probably much more common than we think they are. Do not confuse correlation with causation. All the cool shit in the world that's the smartest shit in the world you don't understand because it's the smartest shit in the world. It takes people a lifetime of dedication and education to even get to understanding the shit that's already out there to have the hopes of building on top of it. 
It is an unfortunate consequence of confusing causation with correlation that made up bullshit that has no value at all is also insanely complex. Unfortunately, therefore, you are not able to effectively use the complexity of a topic to let you know whether it is accurate or whether you should learn about it or care about it. A lot of people take something that's hard to understand, like quantum physics, and try to use it outside of the realm where it is useful and apply it to emotions or feelings or business. Reasoning. Critical thinking means judgmental thinking. Critical thinking isn't called critical because it's required. It just means judgmental. This is the danger of words that have two meanings that are very different. For instance, a patient critical condition versus it's critical that you do a thing. How to catch fraudulent statistics. Benford's law. In any collection of statistics, a given statistic has roughly a 30% chance of starting with the digit one. Richard's comment. That's how you can catch fraudulent numbers being generated by people instead of reality. Avoid the downsides to having just one inaccurate idea. The downside to having one inaccurate idea is, if you believe that the unborn have rights, it is pretty justifiable to go prosecute abortionists. That's unacceptable. One can't really know of a way to disprove that idea. The first wrong idea facilitates more wrong ideas here. It's better to not have the wrong idea in the first place. Unborn people are not people. It's not everyone's job to use all of their sperm and eggs to make you happy, Mr. Advisor Guy. That guy just has to understand that the unborn aren't people and do not have rights, and even if they did have rights and they were being abridged, killing the would-be parents who have already been born isn't the right solution. Christopher Hitchens quoted someone else saying that, For bad men to do bad things is quite simple. But to get a good man to do bad things, you really need religion. Understanding. Rational understanding. Reference the book for Peter Donnelly Statistics Demo. Calibrate your estimate on what you understand properly. The point being, if you are very good at knowing things, but very bad in your estimates at what you understand or don't understand properly, you will harm yourself. You will stop studying things that you should have studied more, and you will mislead the education of the world. On the other hand, if you're super good at knowing what you know and what you don't know, you'll probably actually also harm yourself because you'll be afraid to say anything ever because you're only comfortable speaking with an unreasonable degree of specificity. You might be the kind of guy who's incapable of suggesting what book someone reads because you're deciding whether knowledge can even exist. How do we know what we really know? Are we really just the simulation? You're too smart for your own good. You've become ineffective. Why is it that so much of the popular culture is influenced and created by those that put their balls in their hands, get the job done, and are willing to be wrong? Because it's so important that you'd be better off getting an 80% right and eating shit 20% of the time than making no impact in the world, only saying one thing once ever in your whole life, but being right about it. Unfortunately, everyone else already knew that because the guys that were 80% right already said it 50 times before you got around to it. Increasing your understanding removes limiting beliefs. The funny thing is, when you don't understand an idea good enough, you think you know everything. Lots of 20-year-olds think they know everything. Your capacity to understand complex things, the truly hardest to take, dedication, time, emotion. In a world where intelligence and interest fit on a nice bell curve, the vast majority of people don't even have the capacity to understand the hardest things. Of those that do, the truly hardest things take more than capacity. They take the dedication of time and emotion to excel at. You can't be too good at too many things you run out of time. You really only have time to be a master of few things. Thus, the vast majority of people will have many false beliefs about many things, 
not because they're stupid or malicious, but because life is hard and finite. When you have to hand over your decision-making to experts because they're the only ones with a hope of being right, then whether you are correct or not basically comes down to whether you choose to believe the right expert or not. This is a choice that the super intelligent must make very similar to those less intelligent. We all must defer to the experts on tons and tons of things every day. Capture the prerequisites for bigger and better understanding. The ability for someone to understand a great idea is unfortunately tied to their ability to have created the idea on their own. Similar to the way that burgers can't get much better because we're limited by our taste buds, it's the same reason that you can't share something amazing with them, but they don't have the tools to understand why they should be amazed. You don't know what you have unless you built it yourself. Human intellect has not changed. Knowledge transfer has just increased in quality. Human intellect has not changed. Knowledge transfer has just increased in quality. It's unfortunate that you can read reports and documents from 100 or 1,000 years ago and could believe they were written today. The people of the time had such sharp minds and such thinking abilities that it's a tragedy they didn't have access to the same tools and resources we have today. If the biologists are right, the capacity of the human mind hasn't really increased very much at all in the couple of thousands of years since English and cities have existed. It's quite a wonder to believe that what separates us from them isn't that we are better people, but that we have stored so much energy and knowledge passed down from generation to generation that the lives we live today are massively better than the lives they lived. And it's not because we are smarter. Perhaps just more collectively knowledge containing. Analogies are the best tools for understanding. Use them. It is said that analogy is the most powerful of all learning tools. Analogy is where you take new ideas and show how they're just like other things. Glove is to hand like sock is to foot. Square is to cube like circle is to cylinder. Regardless of all those differences, because you understand the concept of a door, you can really quickly understand and operate all of these. Because analogies are awesome. They're all different in ways that don't really matter, and similar in ways that they need to be for you to kick ass at remembering them. By the way, it's common to see analogies as large components of IQ tests. Therefore, if finding and using analogies is something you can get better at, then you will show a heightened IQ score on many IQ tests. You'll probably be better off with a heightened understanding of the world than yet another test score to brag about but it's a free bonus to an otherwise already awesome behavior. The power of analogy. The more you understand about the world in one area, the more you understand about the world in all the other areas, as long as you learn how to apply the analogy and as long as you learn how to apply the framework somewhere else. It may not increase what they call in the study of intelligence, your big G, your general intelligence how well you do on an IQ test, but you can have big G without ever learning a language. You can have big G in intelligence without ever learning how to do anything. Less complicated ways that lead to understanding. If you want to learn how to speed read and speed while retaining much of the info and actually understand it, then you're studying common patterns that you can apply other places to employ the power of analogy. You're using tools that shift the words in front of your eyes so that you don't have to move your eyes in traditional fashion from left to right across the screen. Those things are proven to work. Everything else that you study that attempts to teach you to speed read, they actually just make you think you understand more. But in reality, you're smoking through the pages reading a lot faster, not absorbing a lot faster basically throwing more information in the garbage. However, at the end of throwing all that information in the garbage, you think you know better than you did. Then they test it. It's been said before, and SciVive will say it here now. The world does not need speed reading. 
The world needs speed understanding, faster, more complex comprehension. Since understanding isn't something that happens better at higher speeds, increasing the speed at which we understand things isn't the right solution. Utilizing an inferior method of understanding faster is crap compared to finding a better way of understanding, which is inherently faster. Not because you're doing it faster, but because it is a better analogy, a better example, a simpler, less complicated way of understanding a thing. As an example, if you say that the burden of proof lies within the person that makes the outrageous statement, well, that's one way of understanding. That's a good way to understand the world. The simpler thing is more likely to be accurate than the more complex thing, because it involves less moving parts to make it happen. Of both of two explanations exist, a more complicated and less complicated one. Both accurately define the way a thing can happen. The less complicated ones more likely to be more accurate, or really less wrong. Less complications leave room for less error. It's a little bit esoteric. It's a little bit hard to understand. Another guy comes along, Bertrand Russell, and he has a funny little saying called Bertrand's tea kettle. What's that? He says, listen, one could say that between us and the moon or us and the sun orbiting is a tea kettle. And if you can't disprove that, then we'll just have to take my assumption that it exists. It's an example of proof through absurdity. This may not be an exact fit, but you could say it's the power of analogy. When you learn martial arts, there are certain moves where if you miss a couple frames, you're weak from a couple frames. You would only know about how many frames a move costs you if you've studied video games in the fighting genre. When you design such games and you give each character a certain set of moves that he can do, it's like a giant abstraction on top of the game, rock, paper, scissors. This move beats that move, but not this move. And then you've got timing relationships. If you try to charge up one move, then you're weak and vulnerable during this period of time. You can, though, bait someone to try and take advantage of that weakness, and then immediately take another action to counter it. Understand that executing ideas in business or in punches and kicks, take an amount of time to execute. Your opposition, unless you're a perfect negotiator or fighter, can tell through your stance, timing, and what you do with your eyes and where you put your weight, what you might throw. This is because they've seen it before. Whatever decisions you make in life, education, fighting, you're going to have downtime. You're going to be telegraphing your intention to people that are watching. Let's say you're at an auction and want to bid on a couch, and you tell everyone in the room what you're willing to pay. You just kind of screwed yourself on the price. Let's say you want to buy one whole street of real estate to go tear the things down and build a bigger piece of real estate, and you don't hide the fact that you're buying up piece by piece. If people begin to figure out that that's what you're trying to do, they can ask you for a shitload more money than their house would be worth by itself because their house is now a requirement for you to complete your set that you've already invested so much into. They can charge you double or triple the market value of their house because you need it more and it's worth the double or triple to you solely because they were aware of your intention. Try playing Monopoly and purchasing Park Place from another player when they know you are holding Boardwalk. Visual diagrams for understanding can hurt you. The reasons that the vast majority of things that you learn in school and work with and use in your day-to-day -day life, you never end up referencing in some cool geometric like formula or intelligence. If you're watching your macros as a guy that works out do, do you actually reference the food pyramid? Never. You have the macros just memorized. If you're doing math, do you ever go back and look at the unit circle to decide how much to do your calculus? Pretty much never. These contrivances of people thinking that some triangle or pyramid might add to people's understanding actually tends to hurt people's understanding. 
using the wrong visualizations screws up our understanding of ideas. We are pattern-finding machines. Let's make use of it. We create patterns. That's what music is. That's what language is. When a man makes love to a woman, and that woman has a beautiful child, that's a new pattern that we created, not totally consciously. Maybe parts of it, but we chose those traits. We chose that time. We chose to give ourselves fully to another person. That's where cool people like us come from. We are built to absorb, process, and create virtual realities that may come true in our head. That's what dreaming is. That's what imagination is. That is what play is. It is us getting the best real world practice we can get without greatly endangering our lives. If you want to have the virtual being chased by a killer experience, you need only wait. It happens in a couple of dreams that you'll remember per year. I'm not sure the rate that you get to have your escape the killer style dreams, but they're useful. If ever one day a killer's actually chasing you, you will do slightly better because you've already pre-calculated some shit that guy might do and some shit that you might do. We arrive at those paths quicker. It's pre-computation. It may be one source of where deja vu comes from. When you experience deja vu, you accidentally have something happen in your real life, something that you pre-compiled in your sleep or in your free time, or you subconsciously saw in a film, or subconsciously imagined happened to somebody else, and then it just brought back that memory of, oh wow, I've seen this before. How Religions Emerge If you put a kid on an island, he'll invent his own religion and ritual. If you take a kid as soon as he's born, you put it and a robot on an island. The robot feeds it until it can handle life on its own, never talks to it, never teaches it anything, that kid is going to find patterns. This is because pattern finding is useful, and those patterns will probably turn into stories. If he ever meets another person, he will tell those stories, and then the opportunity for collectivism and collective benefit and teamwork will exist. The people that believe the same stories will group together and outperform people that don't believe the same shared fictions. Thus, it's not that religions are inherited, it's that religions, in isolation, would emerge for the same profitable reasons that they always have, because pattern recognition is useful. Memory, and therefore storytelling, is useful, and working together is useful. Learning and transmitting knowledge to another person is done through story, the story of imaginary futures. Instructing is taking a pattern found to work and sticking it in someone else's head. What is instructing? Instructing is taking a pattern found to work and sticking it in someone else's head. If you imagine a world that doesn't actually exist and we just stick it in your head, then in that other alternate world that you can say is current or past, whatever, it doesn't abide by the rules of time because it doesn't really exist. It only exists in your mind. The details are up to you. That same pattern finding, storytelling, and collective profit will cause religions to emerge. This is because the access time and processing required to generate a bungled story that is cool to tell, cool to share, and cool to gather behind is a much lower bar and standard than something that we haven't even been able to find with all of our advanced technology. It's cool compelling, easy to tell, easy to follow, and maybe seems to be a factually, scientifically accurate and true story. We've got a lot of cool stories everyone believes. They're all wrong and mutually exclusive. Even if by chance one of them was actually right, all the other ones are still wrong. The vast majority of religious and spiritual stories that everyone tells are wrong by their own definitions without any other research whatsoever because they disagree with each other. Whichever one's right, all the others are wrong. The threshold that pattern recognition, 
storytelling, and collectivism emerges in the behavior of wrong beliefs is like a hundred times lower than something we've not even found yet. Science hasn't become a religion at all. Nobody goes to science school on Sunday and prays to the science god and sleeps with or marries only other science-following chicks. It's not a thing. That's why, even if you find something that works, if you don't have all the other cool stories and side benefits to believing it, it can't compete with religions. Perhaps the closest we have to that is Judaism, literally. You're a doctor, you're a scientist. Okay, and we're cool with you hooking up with our daughter. Not a doctor? Eh? Not a lawyer? Maybe you're not what we want for our daughter. Currently, the Jewish people reward saving, investment, and learning. Other cultures reward adventure, craziness, drinking, partying, shit that is the opposite of investment. You're investing in the death of your liver, which isn't really a good investment at all. What did your liver ever do to you, except try to keep you healthy? The point is, emergent properties exist, and they're not often inherited. They would re-execute in a very similar form on their own, because they pay profits, and the threshold of things that have to align in order for them to emerge is so vastly lower than the other things that we're trying to force to emerge by design. This is why, if you got rid of all of the religions in the world, they would just reappear in slightly different forms, because they provide a competitive advantage to their followers, and an even more exaggerated advantage to their preachers. The set of things that you could misunderstand, the set of ways that you could misunderstand a thing, is nearly infinite compared to the very small set of ways that you could actually understand the way that it really is. And the way that it is really, wildly not. The million other ways that it could be, but isn't. Don't fall for correlation causation fallacy. Improve your understanding and reasoning. The older you get, the more things you see and haven't seen. The easier it is for you to make connections. As a result, the easier it is for you to see connections where they don't really exist, or where they do exist, they don't exist in the way that you wish they did. You find some interesting coincidences. Let's say you Google one topic, and then you're going through the day and you Google something else, and then those two things somehow magically both relate to a third thing. What you'll find more often than not is that the reason that those two seemingly so distantly related topics actually relate is all because of you. The thing that influenced the first result, the thing that influenced the second result, and the thing that influenced you were all quite popular and were pre-selected for popularity. In summary, what you'll find is that you'll have more of these feelings of serendipity the more you use Google or voice recognition. A woman once spoke in tongues into her phone, and her phone gave her very interesting, accurate results. But she didn't realize that the phone didn't have a choice. The phone was going to give the best guess no matter what, and the best guess is always going to give you good results. To teach her the error of her ways, the error that she thought that there was meaning coming from the phone, even though she was speaking gibberish into it, another person spoke gibberish into it, and it also responded with meaningful results, because it had no choice but to attempt to give meaningful results with each question asked. The users are the ones that tried to pretend that something meaningful came from what was asked. In reality, the meaning came from random chance. Some meaning had to be output and the users are the ones making the connection between those two meanings, the gibberish being spoken into the phone and the interesting, unique outcome coming out the other side. Therefore, the more intelligent you are and the better storyteller you are, the more connections you can make, the more believable you can make these false correlations that have no causation. Common Human Misconceptions That Distort Understanding Pattern recognition, making faces out of landscapes and the fronts of cars, in photography of mountains making faces out of landscapes. Sometimes this is done on purpose in marketing. There's a reason why 16-ounce Coke bottles have the same contours as a woman's body. Men are subconsciously attracted to it. Knowing thyself. 
Do not assume the world is as wise as you are. It's hard to know reality. Could you predict ISIS? You must not assume the world is as wise as you. It's not. Know what you know and what you don't. Know the same of others. The Monty Hall problem and the statistics example in that TED Talk once given regarding rolling a dice, where everyone answers it wrong, are very telling. If everyone is working on wrong data and or everyone is making the wrong decisions consistently, you can't really expect great output from persons under that influence, at least in regards to that material. There's merit in tying that lack of knowledge into understanding oneself and having some humility. Find out your goals and the things in life that motivate you. A lot of times being a good teacher doesn't mean that you are a good doer and vice versa. They are different skill sets. Being able to do something and being subconsciously competent at it doesn't make you a good teacher. Being a good teacher requires pedagogic skills that have very little to do with, for instance, the actual act of swimming. This is the reason why, even if you're an Olympic gold medalist, you still might make a negative coach. By definition, subconscious competence means you are quite probably a shit teacher about it because it's subconscious to you, because you don't know why you're good at race car driving, you don't know why you're good at stick, you don't know why you're a good speaker, and to know those things would be an entirely different skill set. Self-knowledge and self-awareness and proper education and motivation is an entirely separate domain and taught as such from being a good businessman or being a good basketball player. A coach that can help you meet goals and refine your objectives and find the golden moving feeling that motivates you in a thing, it works in a lot of places. If you can sell one thing, you can nearly sell anything. Maybe they were compelled when they saw someone winning a competition. Maybe they could feel it when they felt jealous that someone else was achieving something. Memory. The organizing of all important things. The world is a super complicated place. You can't listen to all the songs at once. Even radios listen to only a few stations at a time. We have such a hard time keeping ideas in our minds that we even split 10-digit phone numbers into two sets. That's why it helps us to keep things in easy-to-remember groups and then nest the groups in each other deeper and deeper. Remember that overly simple understanding is more dangerous than overly complex. Overly complex might take a long time to digest, but digest overly simple and you might never discover that you were missing important parts of understanding stuff they used to think back when we didn't know as much about the world. Just these types of images and phrenology images, this secondary consciousness shit, is stuff we just learned rather recently. Don't become a memorizing machine or rely on your memory. It's funny that you shouldn't become a memorizing machine because we have phones, computers, and other people that do that very least important of all mental abilities. At least pass the working memory. You need working memory to build new ideas in your head. But actually, memory of facts and figures and things like that, that you don't need to instantly have. Working memory, that memory is crap. Mnemonic technique, use it. When you interrogate people with good memories or that have exceptional reasoning abilities, you find these common patterns of brain usage that are not chemical. They are concise decisions to use your brain in a certain way. And then after you practice using it that way enough, you're just used to using it that way. Mnemonic technique exists. Chunking exists. Making up funny little sayings with the first letter as something you want to remember. Acronyms, they work. My very easy method just shows us nine planets. That's a mnemonic representation of the planets in order from the sun outward. If it is true that the smartest, most effective, most badass, non-idiot savant people all have little fun tricks and shortcuts they use to make their minds work better, wouldn't that be a good thing to teach people? Wouldn't that be something that could pay dividends forevermore? The answer is certainly yes. What do you know? 
mnemonic technique has existed for thousands of years. Using mnemonic technique lets you know what's important so you can take action. A common mnemonic technique is putting shit in alphabetical order when meeting new people. When one meets a group of people, one could memorize their names by putting them in mind and preferably in the real world in the order of their names. A mnemonic technique is knowing and a mnemonic technique is having desire. If you have desire, it instantly lets you know what is important and what is not. Knowing what is important makes your memory extremely happy. Super easy to remember what you care about. If you love sports, it's super easy to remember stats. If you love gadgets, it's super easy to remember tech. If you love books, it's super easy to remember a thing you read in a book. People love to remember shit that interests them. If you are passionless and without drive and have no desires, well then, how is your brain supposed to know what to put a big ass red flag next to in order to remember? How is it supposed to bookmark what's important to you if you don't tell it, if you don't mention it, if you don't let it feel it? Using mnemonic techniques to make better sense and reduce mental overhead. Using mnemonic techniques to make better sense and reduce mental overhead is critical to learning and memory. As mentioned earlier, the world does not need speed reading. It needs speedy understanding. Speed reading is by definition the opposite of understanding. You're increasing the rate of the data transfer and decreasing the horsepower available to organize and understand that data. Very likely, what you're doing is wasting your time. Now, if you want to get a book over with really quickly, you can skip the speed reading and just look at the table of contents and pretend you learned something from that. Here's the problem. For some reason, most books table of contents are completely useless. It's unclear as to who invented this in books lately, where an author tries to make the table of contents so vague so as to be only useful for someone that has actually completed reading the whole book so that they can translate your negative, vague chapter titles into something actually meaningful. That, fellow readers, hopefully does not follow the guidelines of good style issued by the Associated Press. Hopefully, it doesn't also issue the good elements of styles advertised by Strunk and White, one of the most prescribed for reading books in the college syllabuses of the world. It's like a number three or four most commonly required reading material in the syllabus of easily digitized and searched colleges. Why is this worth mention? One, for you guys out there writing, please stop wasting people's time with fake tables of contents that don't describe the contents. That's like owning a supermarket and no longer categorizing things by what they really are and randomizing which aisles and shelves the products are located. Oh, you want Colgate toothpaste? It's next to the milk. Or Crest toothpaste? It's hidden inside the toilet cleaner section. What a terrible idea. Good categorization, good description, and good mnemonic technique are what human beings need to make sense of this ever more complicated and changing world. Invent more words to spread better understanding. Inventing words is cool. It's one of those things that are difficult to get traction at first, and once you do get the traction, you get explosive results. It's like a new fad diet. If your new diet doesn't become popular, you don't have much impact. But if your diet does become popular, Holy shit, you're going to change the eating habits of a huge portion of the planet for the period of time where that little fat diet was fad full. That's a funny word, fad full. Thus, if you coin new terms and have the balls and the influence to get them to stick, you bring into the global consciousness an easier path to execution for that thing. For instance, there was a time where the term branding didn't exist, and then people figured out that it was something that worked and branding became a new strategy term. They assigned it a word and holy shit, the branding thing is now all over the place. You're going to find that in many examples of human wordsmithing. For example, feeling the burn is a coined term. What's feeling the burn? Oh, that's when you work out real hard and your muscles feel like they're hot. Someone hears that and thinks, oh, feeling the burn, that sounds good, I like that. 
now people are much more likely to work out until they feel a burn. So by coining terms and pushing them to stickiness, if they can be made to be sticky, you further influence actual behavior. It helps to have them sound nice, feel nice, be imaginative, have those little hooks that make mnemonic techniques work. Then you can, for the rest of human endeavor and for the rest of time, as long as that word is used, influence greatly the actions that people take. Saivive is a big proponent of taking what is true and commonly known these days, but no one ever uses it because there's no word for the simple actionable action and malign a word for it in the hopes that people then actually do the thing they know of. Everyone knows that science exists, but not enough individuals learn, practice, and advance it. If we can start to advance little chunks of useful science, then people can receive the advantages from those discoveries. A way to look at life choices. It's interesting that learning frames can help one understand more about the cost of movements and actions. How many frames does it cost you to try and use a new move in a game? With that understanding, some are able to extrapolate it to business and purchasing, and to choices that you make in your life, and to other systems that have feedback that change based on what you do. Just like a fighting game, there's another person looking at the same screen you're looking at who's trying to figure out what you're going to do why you're going to do it, anticipate you, manipulate you, and win. In a fighting game, it's very clear what the goal is, to get rid of the other player's health bar. At that point, your opponent then loses the round. You have health remaining, you win the round, and attempt to win all the rounds. In the real world, it becomes slightly less clear because everyone's got different goals, different bars, other than simple health. Some people want to be loved, some people want to have adventure, and some people want to have all the power they can have. Some people just want to be at peace. Some people don't want to be here at all. They can't wait to get off this trip. Everyone in this world has a completely different set of responses that are kind of hard to predict, somewhat, unless you become a master manipulator or an expert at human behavior. Try to find relevancies in life so that when a thing is similar to something else and you understand the first thing, you now nearly instantly understand the next thing and all other things like it that you ever see again. Take doors, for instance. Every single door that you meet is very different from the last. Some push open, some pull, some are by curious. Some are even split in the middle and just the top can be opened. Some are revolving doors. They're made of wood, glass, metal, or other materials. They even lock in all kinds of different ways, from simple to complex. A vault lock may be extremely complex in operation, but because you understand the concept of doors, you realize that it's all relatively the same idea. And you can recognize that they look cool in comparison to a simple wooden bedroom door. Make cool sayings to ease understanding of ideas and name patterns. You can find the disappearing middle for a logical fallacy. All these examples we have of parable and easy to understand sayings makes understanding complicated stuff a hell of a lot easier because if you didn't have those cool sayings, you might never understand the idea. Some things are hard to understand. When you name a pattern, it's easier to recognize it and use it in the future. Anthropomorphizing ideas is effective. Turn a lot of ideas into people, because people are used to dealing with people. Thinking. Getting the best out of your brain processing power. I wanted to tell you about this specific subreddit called Shower Thoughts and why they're important. I ended up giving dissertation on the effects of groups collaborating and the evolution of their environments on the internet. Shower thoughts. How odd is it that the most resonant name for the idea of unique things you think of is shower thoughts? Why is it that these things occur so often in the shower and so rarely in other places? My theory is that we have a whole lot of great processing power in these great brains of ours 
and that somewhere along the line, one of our great ancestors, someone started running their brain constantly. Instead of only solving problems that were readily apparent, they started solving problems that didn't exist yet. In the animal world, that is basically what play is. You're getting the training and practice that you need without having to risk your life to get it. That's what imagination and deep thought is for human beings. It's our version of animal play. It's what makes us more effective when the time comes, and often we can even create the time where our creative thinking will pay off. It's not just the outcome from the environment. We can change our environment to suit us more often than we change ourselves to match our environment. I know I'm not wiping my ass with leaves. Wouldn't it be a waste to take the massively powerful and creative machine that is the human mind and have it only run half the time instead of all the time? This is how some feel about meditation. If you have to take your engine apart after every race, or if you need to clear your mind or recharge your batteries, use your mind better in the first place. The concept is that forcefully overcoming the well-evolved desire to be curious and think constantly by artificially imposing a blank and empty mind on oneself will somehow cause one to be more effective during uptime. It's a similar but perhaps smaller risk with all this mind experimentation crap. Perhaps some cult really has all the answers you want. Should you go try all the cults? How about all the religions? What about all the mind-altering substances? It is rumored that Francis Crick was on LSD when he discovered DNA. If one had to bet their life, one would be likely to tell you that the vast majority of discoveries have been made by people not on LSD. Perhaps LSD will change your perspective on life, and perhaps you will see a thing in a way you never would have otherwise. Perhaps it would work out well for you, or perhaps not. Perhaps you'll get the same results the vast majority of all other drug users are getting, a change in feeling and perception without a big increase in performance. It's probably unlikely that you would happen to run into a cult of really drugged up, tripping face dudes crushing it in the business world or crushing it in the stock market. Problem solving. Use your intelligence to overcome human problems. Modern Human Adaption Using Intelligence How could we reconcile this tragedy of being ideally suited for the world that no longer exists? Do you know how we can best use our intellect to overcome these problems in the same way as we did to surmount all other problems the humanity was facing in the past? For the last hundred thousand years, a life for a human being has been brutal, short, and painful. There was no need for you to leave your neighborhood, learn new languages, and find out why the hell something happened. Your teeth fell out, and there were all kinds of bad, unexplainable diseases. Now it's better. There is dentistry, and we can now explain, treat, and often cure those diseases that were once fatal. Don't solve problems you don't have. Every problem you solve that you don't have means there's another looming problem you ignored that you do have. Take the limited time that you have and spend it on what is here and what actually matters. Don't be a would-be philosopher that learns how to solve the world's problems that aren't yours. Solve problems and adjust your frustration. The whole world is spending all their money to learn something. Why is it that you can make money fixing people's phones? Why is it that they just don't spend the hours to do it themselves? Their brains have been programmed to disengage in activity that might be very valueless compared to some other activity. They get frustrated very quickly. They get frustrated very easily. Because 1,000 years ago, 10,000 years ago, when the Earth's psychology was evolving and deciding which a better strategy was, some people got frustrated more easily. Some people got frustrated less easily. Back then, in those environments, the problems that you had to solve were much simpler. You would see much more profit by getting frustrated easier, because an alternative, sideways solution would be much closer at hand. Your range of problem-solving abilities was a lot wider when the complexity is reduced. Every layer of complexity that you include decreases your problem-solving abilities. 
If you're creating software, you can't be off by a comma. You can't be off by a period, and you can't be off by a bracket versus a parenthesis. Solve today's problems. Solve today's problems instead of solving the problems of the future that doesn't yet exist. What kind of clothes will you wear when you're the world's strongest man? Don't waste your time. You are not going to be the world's strongest man. Don't be shopping for giant clothes. What are you going to do with all your riches? Which island are you going to buy? Don't waste your time. You are not buying any islands. Solve today's problems today. The funny thing is that by solving today's problems more efficiently, you are more likely to end up with the problem of which island to buy. But by solving that which island to buy problem, now you won't ever get the privilege of having the problem. Usually in life, to be effective, basically all the time, you've got to solve the questions that are today's problem to earn the right to have tomorrow's problem. Worry about today's problem. Don't sacrifice today's effectiveness for the dream of tomorrow's effectiveness because you could be optimizing for the wrong shit. You could be optimizing for a reality that will never happen. Don't solve what others think are problems, but what you think are problems. It may be detrimental to be of the mindset of profitability and solving problems for money, using other people's problems to relief pinpoints, find profit, and have correct action over incorrect action. The problem with that old style belief is that your paths in life are restricted to what other people think their problems are. The problem with what other people think are their problems is that they use their beliefs and their values to decide what their problems are half the time. Their beliefs and values are screwed up. Now you're trapped in doing erroneous things in your life because you think you're relieving pain. You think you're solving problems. You are, but those people shouldn't have had that pain and those problems if they used their brains better in the first place. Most people that want help with a problem have actually misidentified what the actual problem is, and they think they have a problem planning when instead they have a problem doing. A much higher, better use of your intellectual abilities, business talents, talents of any form, are to not solve what other people think are problems but to solve what you think are problems, assuming that you're smarter than they are and have better beliefs. Don't live your life blocking people's ideas or solving the problems of others. Don't live your life blocking people's ideas or solving the problems of others. Another good way to look at that is if you ask people what they would prefer when the automobile was invented, they prefer a better horse. They don't want a damn car, they wanted a better horse. The same happens if you ask the people that wrote the laws for airplanes what kind of laws they should have. They already had laws for boats, and because airplanes were so new, they included stupid laws that said you had to have lifeboats on the airplane. It took time for the law to catch up with reality. If you think about the problems of others or judge the rightness or wrongness of their ideas, you are but a mirror of their thoughts. That causes you to neglect your own ideas and restrict your creativity if you are only a reflection of someone or something. Let them react to you by advertising your own truth instead of negating their statements and falling into their framing of the world. Don't live your life as a blocker of ideas and don't live your life as a problem solver of other people's problems because you will be restricted by what problems they think matter and what they're aware of. Solve the problems people are unaware of. You think Steve Jobs invented the iPhone because people were yearning for something that didn't have any buttons? No, they would have probably told you that the things without buttons were stupid. How would you dial it in the dark? How would you dial it if the screen got wet? And so on. Now, everything that we have that's the best of class device has one, two, or three buttons and no more. You would have never gotten to that conclusion and created that invention if you were focused on solving other people's problems that they were aware of. You need to be focused on the problems that they're unaware of. That means creative individual production and thought, not mindless groupthink focused by the constraints of the idiots of the world that you're forced to interact with. Troubleshooting is hard. 
you need to acquire experience solving real-world problems. Lots of people don't know much of shit about problem solving, or how easy it is to make the wrong call on the solution to a problem because they haven't actually had much experience solving real-world problems. In the real world, when you encounter a problem, that problem could be caused by many different things. Even when you go one by one and try to eliminate the potential causes, you run into fun ones, where things fail only some of the time, but work other times, intermittence. Another possibility is that you get two intermittent problems at the same time, so when you implement a fix, it works sometimes and not others. Or, the solution to your original problem causes a new one. Or the test you just did to see if your guess was right actually was right, but you can't tell because you just broke something else during the test. Now you actually have two broken things if you revert your fix. Intermittent problems. There are three things worse than an intermittent problem when you're troubleshooting, because what would solve the problem doesn't. Therefore, you think it's not a solution because the normal failure state isn't occurring when you're trying to implement that solution. Let's get a better understanding on troubleshooting the human body. If you want to know how poorly we understand what's going on in the human body, guess how they test to see how much pain you're in. In a hospital, they literally hang pictures of varying facial expressions, and then they assume that the facial expression equals your facial expression, asking you to point at which expression matches your pain. Therefore, you're in whatever amount of pain the drawing is in. That is pretty sad. Or they could ask you to assign a point value to how much pain you're in, say from 1 to 10. The problem is that one person's pain level of 5 may be another person's pain level of 8. How is that helpful to the doctor diagnosing your problem? There's probably a better way, perhaps using fMRI, functional magnetic resonance imaging, but the facial expression poster, or asking you 1 to 10, is much cheaper and easier and faster to use than an fMRI. Fixing things in the real world can actually be pretty tough, but starting to troubleshoot all these complicated issues you are learning about is actually easy because at least you have a decent list in your mind that is finite of how many potential causes for failure there could really be. What do you do when you don't even know the system well enough to know the complete list of ways that the thing could be broken? This is where we are at with the human body. We can barely tell what is going on in there. We have a pitiful understanding of what really happens inside cells, and for the most part, we are just a giant organization of lots of cells. Think about how limited our diagnostic tools are to try and even guess what's going on. We can stick a stethoscope on your chest and listen to your heart for a little bit. We can try to hear the sound your lungs make when breathing. We can check your pulse rate and your blood pressure at a single instance in time. This is definitely not rocket science. Maybe we can extend the amount of time we measure and the rate we sample. Maybe that is a little better. Now, what are all the things we can't see in real time? Hormone levels, oxygen levels, blood composition, how many different kinds of cells are in there, and so on. There's really not too much we can tell in a reasonable time frame at all, and most of it requires drawing blood, which puts extra load on your body, because you need to replace that blood. You can only do so much of that. Literally, some of our required diagnostics require us shoving fingers or overly large cameras up your ass. If having another person's finger up your ass isn't your kind of party, it's probably a good in indication that our tools for telling what's going on in a patient's body are pretty negative, pardon the pun. If you've not banged your head against the wall for a couple years solving hard problems, your suggestions for solutions might be pretty poor. Mind maps suck. Tony Bazan and the creating of the concept of the mind map and trying to profit off it, it was an idea of a guy who built an idea that sucks and doesn't work and makes the world a worse place, but somehow gives you the hope that it will work out and waste a lot of people's time. Mind mapping is garbage. If it was a good way to organize data, books would come as fold out mind map posters. Because nature is disorganized doesn't mean disorganization is a goal. It's the opposite of organization. 
if you thought spitting out ideas linked to other ideas in a star-shaped format was good because it was organic, then why wouldn't you make it three-dimensional and rotatable like the real world? Or perhaps have a floor like the real world? Since you like nature so much, hell, let's have wild animals piss on your mind map and let a hurricane blow it apart too. Ever try to find a house in a neighborhood with streets that are organic and curved instead of lines in a grid? It's a nightmare. Straight lines beat organic squiggly lines. Knowing lots of things is very different from being able to make good decisions about things. You could say that knowing how to make good decisions should be the first thing you learn and know, for it will greatly enhance your performance on all other things you will ever learn. Just like learning to read and speak are great first steps down the path of knowledge, so should learning to think well be the third step just after speaking and reading. Flip a coin. If you feel the urge to flip it again, you've already decided. Analysis Paralysis If you want to chop down a forest, you don't stare at it trying to figure out how all the trees are related to each other and putting them in order. You just walk up to the first tree that you want to cut down and start chopping. There's a luxury here in not understanding the entire architecture and just getting to work. When writing a book, for example, it would be harder to predict what the book would look like than it would be to just write the book. This is why book, song, and movie titles are often the last thing one focuses on. The creator has to first create the artifact in its entirety in order to produce a great title for it. Making accurate predictions is really hard. Thus, when a problem is complicated enough, you can be better off just doing the things you know you need to try, no matter what, and while you're doing them, your subconscious will be working on guessing what the future will look like. Most people don't have an understanding problem, they have a motivation problem. They think their understanding and their plans aren't good enough, so they don't do them, not knowing that many of the best things in the world started with terrible plans and just changed along the way into something great. In a business, they call it pivoting. When your first plan doesn't work, you attempt to execute a different plan. This is similar to the pottery teacher who split her class into two. One half of the class would be graded on a single piece at the end of the semester, and the other half of the class would just be graded by the pound. It was an experiment showing the difference between being very productive and being thoughtful, and then just a burst of productivity much later on. The quality of the people that produced by the pound was better than the quality of the people that thought a lot and built a single work. Building things and evolving them beats thinking and pre-planning too much and building at the last minute, if you ever get around to it. Avoid fallacies. Russell's Teapot Clarity can be achieved in different ways. Russell's Teapot is proof that even if something is already present in the logical canon and education, that a great and visual analogy relying on absurdity can be so useful and widely quoted as to become the primary name and reference for the example. Clarity and brevity matter greatly in all things of the mind. It's basically an easier to understand version of argument from ignorance. Proximity fallacy. Avoid being misled. There's this logical fallacy of a thing near a thing gets influenced by the thing. Michael Jordan wears Nikes, therefore he's associated with Nikes. He's great, therefore Nikes must be great. That's because human beings' brains don't dissect that well. One can list for you some other great people associated with some bullshit things, and just because someone is associated with a thing doesn't mean that thing is rubbed off on them. The reason I mention this is because it's a tactic of association by proximity, which is something we're going to try and do by helping our readers achieve everything that they want in life and trying to get them to take their own survival into their own hands, which is not something they would have bought a book on from the get-go. Descriptive names for fallacies are useful for future avoidance. Lots of fallacies have easy to remember and useful names. For instance, the disappearing middle, the slippery slope, the straw man, and so on. It's really hard to make use of the framing fallacy because it's difficult to know when to apply it. If you know the framing fallacy exists, 
when you use framing to make two things that are equal seem different, you only know that the fallacy exists if you already know that the two things are equal. If you don't know the two things are equal because you're already having the fallacy executed upon you, they seem wildly different. You can't make use of knowing about the fallacy because you never know when to trigger your knowledge of its existence because you would only know by seeing the quality of two things, and you can't judge their quality without already knowing that you are in the fallacy. Basically, because you're in the shit, you can't tell you're in the shit. The fallacy of the unqualified percentage. It's possible that people don't understand how negative stats on increased crime are unless you get them to see it linearly. You say, listen, because the crime rate is X in some places, 100 or 200 or 10,000 extra people have to suffer because of that. Then you show the linear actual crime rates that occur instead of just showing some percentage that doesn't have a face. Increases look larger than discounts because look indicates the misperception. If a new logical description for this common error of using a percentage can be found when a flat rate may better serve, 30% discount is always equal to a 50% increase, well, then you could use language that says, small discount equals large increase. No one really knows what framing is. It's a pretty big mental jump for people to understand the meta context of the way an argument is structured. There are two different fallacies that should be described. One is called the unqualified percentage. You say that you doubled your sales? So what? What does that mean qualitatively? You went from one to two? Don't tell me half the story, the misleading half. Oh, you know, we ramp up our customers 25% every month, but how many customers do you have? Two? The other fallacy is that discounts are always smaller than increases. And so a 33% discount is really a 50% increase in cost. 30% tax is really 50% increase in money that you have to make in order to cancel that out. So the two fallacies are unqualified percentages and discounts are smaller than increases. If you want to see a place where they execute the real world discounts are smaller than increases fallacy of understanding numbers, it's the buy two, get one half off. When you do the math, you end up with two at a price of 150%, which means you paid 75% for each, which means you really got a 25% discount by buying twice what you needed. If you told anyone that I'll give you a 25% discount if you buy double, they'd respectfully decline. But if you abuse the frame and use the larger discount, which is 50 instead of 25, they think that it's 50. They don't know that it's 25 because all you mentioned was 50. Most people can't do math very well in their head. Be careful not to let mental illusions mislead you in this way. So the example of getting 50% off buying two, instead of saying you get 25% off when you buy twice, is as effective when making sales. You can feel the pull when you hear the pitch. And I believe that understanding that people only know the reference number that you've given them, it's called anchoring, and understanding that people don't understand discounts very well is a useful way to avoid getting ripped off and getting 25% off when you thought you were getting something around 50%. If you're in the position of setting prices, well, you found a new way to get your clients money. Anytime you're reading the news or some articles and you see something going up some 100% or down some percent, you must always ask, of what to what? Or from what to what? It's the unqualified percentage. It's also like Betteridge's law regarding headlines, where they say, something could mean this, or is it really that? And the answer to all those questions is usually no. If the thing was actually that, then that would be the headline. And the only time you use stupid headlines like that example is when you don't have something better to write about. Understanding small discount, large increase equivalence, and unqualified percentage. Cyvive seeks to invent two new terms. One is small discount, large increase equivalence, where you get a 33% discount and it really means you would have paid 50% more 
had you not got the 33% off. The reason that exists is because sometimes percentages cause you to know less than you originally knew. In this instance, it's just $33. You can either pay it or not pay it. The concept of the $33 being a portion of something else, or a portion of some other thing, doesn't really matter in this example. What matters is that it is $33. What doesn't matter so much is what portion that $33 is. Whether you take it off the preceding number, which is quite large, and then it makes the 33 seem quite small, or the latter number, which is smaller by exactly 33, and therefore is a larger percentage of that. You don't learn that much data by choosing to take your 33 and divide it by one or the other. The learning is that it is a common misconception that is going to happen when you take a flat number and try and make it a percentage for sometimes reasons that don't make sense. The second invention is the unqualified percentage. So you doubled your sales, yay, but from what? So you don't ever take someone's percent figure without the of what. SciVive calls the fallacy the unqualified percentage, and that's basically because the percentage doesn't mean anything unless you qualify it with the of what. Just like when you read a questionable headline, this matters. To whom and why do I care? You need to qualify it. Paradoxes exist because of lack of understanding. Get better at measuring things and paradoxes may disappear altogether. Paradoxes only seem like paradoxes because we poorly understand the real world and sometimes our shortcuts lead us astray. Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, the dual slit theory of wave versus particle light analysis. Basically, people think that when you are measuring things at the subatomic level, that you can't measure them without changing them. Therefore, they think that the universe is conscious, and therefore that conscious universe is measuring what your consciousness is doing. The conscious universe notices that your consciousness is trying to measure something, and whereas it normally would just allow two things to exist at the same time and not decide to be in one place instead of another, as soon as you measure it, a decision gets made and goes to that single place. It's a misunderstanding. It first is an anthropomorphism, trying to assign intention and group game theory as to that thing that has a consciousness and is an individual actor with its own mode of operation. That shit is not conscious and it does not care what you do and the reason it changes when you measure it is because at that level, all measurement involves tampering with the thing you are measuring. You cannot measure something without altering it. And if you can't stop screwing with it, then you are obviously influencing it. Therefore, it's not the universe that is influencing its decision. It's you through doing the measurement, which changes instead of the magical measurement, which doesn't exist, which remains unchanged. Biases. The smarter get smarter, the dumb get dumber. If you're right, you'll get more right. If you're wrong, you'll get more wrong. Whoever gets to decide your confirmation bias first gets to write your personality to some degree. You will vote and act like your parents, most likely. Socratic method. Skills. Subconscious competence. You can do things well even if you don't understand how you're doing them. For instance, when you tell someone how to ride a bike, you might think that they will fall while turning because they didn't know that they should lean away from a turn. This doesn't happen often because they learn and execute it subconsciously. Bash your head to greatness, dreaming and competence. People that are more subconsciously competent may have the same dream over and over again, which helps them practice when they are not really practicing. Proximity isn't really power. Proximity isn't really powerful by itself. Just because you're near something doesn't mean you're good at it. You can be a race car driver, and it doesn't mean you know how to tune your engine. It also doesn't mean you know how to lay pavement, and the same thing goes for any one of those other industries. The world is rather complex, and so in order to actually be good at any single thing these days, you kind of have to be good at that thing, and being good at things related to it just won't cut it. 
software developers are all the time beating their head against the wall trying to figure out how to get their goddamn graphics card to work because it's a totally different skill set. Writing code and then forcing NVIDIA's dogshit drivers to work properly are two different skill sets. Warren Buffett How cool is it that Warren Buffett uses the same analogy as SciVive with intelligence being horsepower? He says that efficiency is rationality. It's how much output you get out of the power you've got. He is all about rationality in this talk. Pick out someone you admire out of the audience and write down why you admire them. Don't name yourself. Now pick out the one that you can stand the least out of the whole group and put down the qualities that turn you off about that person. You'll find that the qualities that you admire are ones that you can make your own with a little practice. The habits you will have in 20 years are the habits that you build today. It's all about rationality. Emulate the traits of those around you that you respect and avoid those traits of those people you shun. If you don't get where you want to go, it's not because the world kept you down. It's because you got in your own way. Buffett's car IQ analogy only contained efficiency and power, nothing about steering, traction, direction, etc. Quotes Success is getting what you want and happiness is wanting what you get. The chains of habit are too light to be felt until they are too heavy to be broken. You ought to be happy where you're working. Don't save up sex for your old age and don't stay in things that suck for long at all. Why would you marry for money if you're already rich? Turn down good business deals if the people you would have to work with make your stomach churn. He seems very concerned with who he has to work with. If you tell me who your heroes are, I can tell you how you'll turn out. None of Warren's heroes have let him down. In quotes, my dad, my wife, Ben Graham at Columbia. Narrator's note, the following is titled Coursera, Learning How to Learn, and it looks like a syllabus for a Coursera course. Week one, what is learning? Brain facts. Cells of the nervous system are called neurons. Information from one neuron flows to another neuron across a synapse. Human brain has a million billion synapses. Your brain creates synapses whenever you learn something new. Sleeping helps update your brain cells, literally. Why do we procrastinate scientifically? Problem. Learning a new thing or doing something you would rather not do can be stressing. This can cause anxiety at first. This activates the area associated with pain in the brain. Your brain looks for a way to stop that negative feeling by switching your attention to something else more pleasant. Solution. The trick is to just start. Researchers discover that not long after people start actually working out what they didn't like, that neuro discomfort disappeared. Remember that the better you get at something, the more enjoyable it can become. Consider using the Pomodoro Technique. Learning hard and abstract things. The more abstract something is, the more important it is to practice, to create, and strengthen neural connections to bring the abstract ideas to reality for you. Example, you should practice a lot with the math vocabulary to understand it and recall it easier. Summary of learning. There are two modes of thinking. Focused mode, concentrating on things that are usually familiar. Diffused mode. A relaxed mode of thinking, your thoughts are free to wander. When you don't desire doing learning something, go through it and just start. The discomfort goes away and, in the long term, this will lead to satisfaction. When you learn something new, make sure to take time to rest, then come back to it and recall what you learned. This is very important. Don't cram information in one day. This leads to inefficient learning. It's like building a wall without letting it dry. Revisiting and practicing what you learn is important. Research shows that spaced repetition, repeating things after a few days, is the best way to build and strengthen the synaptic connections. Sleep is very important. 
It clears the metabolic toxins from the brain after a day of brain use. It is best to sleep directly after learning new things. It was shown that exercise and or being in a rich social environment helps your brain produce new neurons. Don't lock yourself in your room. Stay active and allow spare time for exercise, including general physical activities and friends daily. Week two, chunking. Chunks. Chunking is the act of grouping concepts into compact packages of information that are easier for the mind to access. Pieces of information, neuroscientifically speaking, bond together through use and meaning. They can get bigger and more complex, but at the same time, they are single, easy to access items that can fit into the slot of the working memory. For example, if you understand and practice a math formula, you no longer will need to focus much to solve it like you did the first time. That's because your formula chunk got so abstracted into your brain that it can only take one slot of your working memory to solve it. Turn off distractions. You want to use all the four slots of your working memory when studying. Learning will be inefficient if some of those slots are connected to something else. You have to solve the problem yourself. Just because you see it or even understand it doesn't mean that you will be able to solve it. Illusion of competence. It is always easier to look at the material, even if you think it's easy, than working through it yourself. It gets easier. When you think that a chapter or a book has too much information and that there's no way to go through it all, just focus on whatever section you're studying. You'll find that once you put that first concept in your mental library, the following one will be easier. This concept is called transfer. A chunk you have mastered in one area can often help you much more easily learn other chunks of information in different areas. Master the major idea and then start getting deeper. However, make sure not to get stuck in some details before having a general idea. Practice to help yourself gain mastery and sense of the big picture context. Try taking a picture walk before you dig through the material. This means look briefly at the pictures, chapter titles, formulas used, before diving into details. Recall mentally without looking at the material. This is proven more effective than simply reading. Reread only after you try to recall and write down what was in the material. Consider recalling when you are in different places to become independent of the cues from any given location. This will help you when taking a test in the class. Test yourself to make sure you are actually learning and not fooling yourself into false learning. Mistakes are a good thing. They allow you to catch illusions of competence. Don't always trust your initial intuition. Einstellung problem, a German word for mindset. An idea or neural pattern you developed might prevent a new, better idea from being found. Sometimes your initial intuition on what you need to be doing is misleading. You need to unlearn old ideas and approaches as you are learning new ones. Mix up the problems. Interleaving from different chapters. This is helpful to create connections between your chunks. It can make your learning a bit more difficult, but it helps you learn more deeply. Interleaving is very important. It is where you leave the world of practice and repetition and begin thinking more independently. Don'ts. Highlighting too much and creating maps are often ineffective without recalling. Repeating something you already learnt or know very well is easy. It can bring the illusion of competence that you've mastered the full material when you actually just know the easy stuff. Balance your studies and focus on the more difficult deliberate practice. This sets the difference between a good student and a great student. A big mistake is to blindly start working on an exercise without reading the textbook or attending the class. This is a recipe of sinking. It's like randomly allowing a thought to pop off in the focus mode without paying attention to where the solution truly lies. Week 3. Procrastination and Memory Procrastination. 
The routine, habitual responses your brain falls into when you try to do something hard or unpleasant. Focusing only on making the present moment feel better. Unlike procrastination, which is easy to fall into, willpower is hard to come by. It uses a lot of neural resources, and you shouldn't waste it on fending off procrastination, except when really necessary. You actually don't need to. The long-term effects of procrastination can be dangerous. Putting your studies off leads to studying becoming even more painful. Procrastination is a habit that affects many areas of your life. If you improve in this area, many positive changes will unfold. Procrastination shares features with addiction. At first, it leads you to think that if you study too early, you'll forget the material. Then, when the class is ahead of you, it leads you to think that you are inadequate or that the subject is too hard. You want to avoid cramming, which doesn't build solid neural structures, by putting the same amount into your learning and spacing it over a long period by starting earlier. First time learning something. The first time you do something, th the deluge of information coming at you would make the job seem almost impossibly difficult. But once you've chunked it, it will be simpler. At first, it's really hard. Later, it's easy. It becomes like a habit. Example, driving for the first time. Habits. Neuroscientifically speaking, chunking is related to habit. Habit is an energy saver. You don't need to focus when performing different habitual tasks. Habits can be good or bad, brief or long. Habits part. The cue. The trigger that launches you into zombie mode. Habitual routine. Recognize what launches you into zombie procrastination mode. Location, time, feelings, reaction to people or events. Consider shutting your phone or internet off for brief periods of time to prevent most cues. The routine. Routine you do in reaction to the cue. You only need to use your willpower to change your reaction to the cues. Actively focus on rewiring your old habits. You need a plan. You need some willpower. The reward? Habits exist because they reward us. Zero. Give yourself bigger rewards for bigger achievements, but after you finish them. One. Example, if I study for four hours today, I'll watch a movie guilt-free at night. Two. Habits are powerful because they create neurological cravings. It helps to add a new reward if you want to overcome your previous cravings. 3. Only once your brain starts expecting a reward will the important rewiring take place that will allow you to create new habits. 4. The belief. To change your habits, you need to change your underlying belief. 5. Example. You might feel like you'll never be able to change the habit of studying late. This is not true. You can actually rewire your brain. 6. Joining a student community helps, either online or in real life. 7. Trust your system. You have to feel happy and worry-free when you are resting. Weekly slash daily list. Researchers showed that writing your daily list the evening before helps you accomplish them the next day. If you don't write them down, they will take the valuable slots of memory. Plan your finishing time. This is as important as planning your working time. Work on the most important and most disliked task first, even if it's only one. Pomodoro. Take notes about what works and what doesn't. Have a backup plan for when you will still procrastinate. Focus on process. You should realize that it's perfectly normal to start a learning session with a negative feeling, even if you like the subject. It's how you handle those feelings that matters. Solution. Focus on the process, not the product. The product is what triggers the pain that causes you to procrastinate. Instead of saying, I will solve this task today, 
put your best effort for a period of time continuously over the days. Memory. Use your visual memory to remember things. Example, link a memorable picture to a formula. Images help you encapsulate a very hard to remember concept by tapping into visual areas with enhanced memory abilities. The more neural hooks you can build by evoking the senses, the easier it will be for you to recall the concept. Keep repeating what you want to learn so that the metabolic toxins won't siphon away the neural patterns related to that memory. Spaced repetition is the key. Flashcards help. Consider using Anki. Handwriting helps you deeply convert what you are trying to learn into neural memory structures. Memory techniques. Create meaningful groups and abbreviations. To remember numbers, associate them to memorable events. Create mnemonic phrases from first letters of the words you want to remember. Memory place technique. Use a familiar place, like the blueprint of your house, and associate visual images of things you want to remember with physical places. This is not easy. You'll be very slow at first, but with practice, you'll get better. The more you practice your memory muscle, the easier you'll remember. Week four, Renaissance learning and unlocking your potential. You should know, exercising is by far more effective than any drug to help you learn better. It helps new neurons survive. Learning doesn't always progress linearly and logically. Inevitably, your brain will hit a knowledge collapse sometimes. This usually means your brain is restructuring its understanding, building a more solid foundation. You learn complex concepts by trying to make sense out of the information you perceive, not by having someone else explain it to you. Metaphors. Metaphors and analogies are very helpful, not only to memorize, but to also understand different concepts. It is often helpful to pretend that you are the concept you're trying to understand. Intelligence. Intelligence does matter. Being smart usually equates to having a large working memory, more than just four slots. However, a super working memory can hold its thoughts so tightly that new thoughts won't easily find a way into the brain. Such a tightly controlled attention could use an occasional breath of ADHD. Your attention shifts even if you don't want it to shift. Deliberate practice is what helps the average brain lift into the realm of those naturally gifted. Practicing certain mental patterns deepens your mind. Brilliant scientists like Ramon y Cajal, the father of neuroscience, or Charles Darwin were not exceptionally gifted. The key to their success was perseverance, taking responsibility for their learning and changing their thoughts. Take pride in the qualities you excel at. Tune people out if they try to demean your efforts. Right Hemisphere Helps us put our work into the big picture perspective and does reality checks. When you go through a homework or test question and don't go back to check your work, you're acting like a person who's refusing to use parts of the brain. Left Hemisphere Interprets the world for us, but with a tendency for rigidity dogmatism, and egocentricity may lead to overconfidence. Example, believing dismissively that your answers are correct. Best practices. Always step back and recheck to take advantage of abilities of both hemispheres' interactions. Brainstorm and find focused people to analyze your work with. Your errors are sometimes easier to be found by others. Explaining yourself to others helps you understand more. Studying in a team helps you catch what you missed or what you can't see. Don't fool yourself. Don't blindly believe in your intellectual abilities. Having a team can bring those projections down. Test checklist. Did you make a serious effort to understand the text? If you had a study guide, did you go through it? Did you attempt to outline every homework problem solution? Did you understand all your homework problems solutions? 
If not, did you ask for explanations? Did you work with classmates on homework problems? Have they checked your solutions? Did you consult your instructor or teacher when you had a problem with something? Did you sleep well the night before the test? Test taking technique. Hard start, jump to easy. Try this strategy with homework problems first. Take a quick look at the test when it's handed to you to get a sense of what it involves. Start with the hardest problem. Pull yourself out if you get stuck for over two minutes. Starting with a hard problem loads your focused mode first and then switches attention away from it. This allows the diffused mode to start its work. Turn next to an easy problem, solve what you can, then move back to a hard one. This allows the different part of your brain to work simultaneously on different thoughts. Test taking tips. Being stressed before a test is normal. The body releases chemicals when it's under stress. How you interpret the body reaction to those chemicals makes all the difference. Shift your thinking from, I am afraid of this test, to, I am excited to do my best. If you are stressed during a test, turn your attention to breathing. Relax. Put your hand on your stomach and slowly draw some deep breaths. This will calm you down. Relax your brain on the last day before a test. Have a quick final look at the materials. Feeling guilty the last day is a natural reaction even if you are prepared well. So relax. Good worry motivates you. Bad worry wastes your energy. Double check your answers. Look away, shift your attention, and then recheck.